question. How do you consider of your role in the government? My official role is that of a digital minister. Uh, but in Taiwan, there is no digital ministry. Um, so because of that, I work with all the different ministries on what we call digital transformation. Digital transformation, in a sense, is doing exactly what the public service is doing, but doing it with the people instead of for the people. Because in the previous era, before the internet, before the social media, it is very difficult to listen to millions of people. It's much easier to speak to millions of people using radio and television. But now for the first time using the internet, we can co-create and listen to millions of people. And actually, if we don't do that in the public service, people in the civil society do that anyway. And so the people will feel much closer to each other and much more distance with the public sector, right? So the public and the public servants, they used to be of this distance, but now with the digital tools, the people are much closer to each other, and so they feel much more farther away from the public service. But the public service can also use the same digital tools to engage not just with the public, but also among the different ministries, so that we form a much better working relationship that responds faster, that listens to more people, and that discuss things in a much wider scale, and sharing through transparent means what exactly is the public service doing to engender better understanding. And so this is the digital transformation that I'm working with all the ministries together. In the government side, it's called open government. In the civil society side, it's called social innovation. But it's the same thing. It's just two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So you are a fierce supporter of the transparency of information. Yes. Um, how did you impose this culture on the government? So um, in my original culture, the open source culture, or the open culture movement, the free culture movement, transparency is the norm. Uh, all the different um, ideas in the open source society, or in Wikipedia, for example, they're all transparent for everybody to see. And because of this, it gains trust, accountability, and legitimacy. When you look at the government, actually, the parliaments are also working in the same regard. All the parliamentary hearings, parliamentary debates, and all the different commissions, they're not just kept in transcript, but are also now being live-streamed. And even in the judicial branch, we're now gradually introducing a jury system. And all the courts, all the different proceedings, unless it's on some very confidential or sensitive issues, it's open by default. It's just the administration itself that is not using the same radically transparent ideas, and therefore people feel more distant, and people don't actually know how different ministries think about things, which I think is a lost opportunity. If people can know how exactly does the public executive look at each policy issues, they can contribute much more meaningfully. So I basically tell people in the administration, look at the judicial branch, look at the parliamentary end. They, they have been doing the same things to engender people's trust, so we can adopt much of the same idea in the administration. Um, to promote exchange with civil society and citizens, you have designed a platform for, for debates. That's right. Um, can you explain how it works? Yes. So uh, this platform called the Join platform has three functions. First, there is an e-petition function where anyone who amassed about 5,000 signatures, and those are done through SMS, uh, it is not uh, tied to the real identity. So anyone who has a mobile phone account can join this petition. And they can petition a wide range of things. People petition for redesigning the text filing software or people petition for changing the time zone of Taiwan. So from very practical to very pra political, um, anything can be petitioned on this um, platform. And there is a pro and con conversation happening in real time on this uh, debate platform. And we look at the best ideas that are flagged as pro ideas and the best idea that are contra ideas and bring them as well as people who sign the petition into face-to-face -face conversations twice a month. And so this is the petition part. The second is the regulation part. For all the laws and bills proposed by the administration to the legislation, uh, we announced for 60 days on the same platform for the public to have a debate. So in a sense, this is like people's assembly before the parliament to look at it. Uh, people can just propose their ideas and for the parliament to consider it. But we extend it not just to the laws and regulations, but also for internal policies, for things that are not 
decided by the parliament, but actually just by a single ministry. Those internal regulations and policies were also announced for 60 days on the same platform. So people who don't have a parliamentarian to speak to them for this kind of regulation issues can nevertheless speak for themselves on the regulation uh, platform. And then finally, uh, as of last month, we announced that thousands, 1,200 of uh, projects maintained by each uh, ministry, they have their own KPIs, they have procurements, they maybe uh, have some spending budgets and so on. They are all tracked within the ministry itself before, but now we open this kind of auditing to everybody so they can renew it every three months or every month and everybody sees what exactly is this like nine year or eight year project, where it's going, how much spending it's done, how much KPI has it achieved. And so previously, it is only the purview of the auditing agencies to look at, but now it's for everybody to look at. And anyone can look at one part in the budget and comment on the part that they feel that relevant to them, and the public servant will respond immediately without going through the parliament or the mainstream media. So you took a drone. Take what you need You have taken a transversal, transversal position, transversal action. Um, it means you have uh, maybe shaken the um, administrative bureaucracy. Um, did um, government, did um, different ministries play the game uh, on this digital revolution? Mm. So I think one of the main things that we brought is the so-called participation officer network or PO network. Every ministry need to assign a team, usually maybe two or five or six people, and they're engaging the public in general. Whereas before, every ministry only have officers for media, like with traditional journalism, or with the officers that talk about the MPs, the parliamentary officers, but now they also have officers that talk to the general public or the civil society. And so all these kind of uh, new designs, such as the open spending, the KPI that I just talked about, this gets uh, cleared by all the different participation officers. It is actually a collective decision by a PO network. So we did not impose it to the ministry as much as we proposed it as a good idea a year ago. And the POs tell us maybe the administration itself should try the administration uh, managed projects first. So we tried a small pilot, about 60 projects. And for a year, they see that it really increased the quality of the discussion and also reduces the time burden of the public servants because they don't have to answer for the one by one inquiries anymore. They can just answer once public and it could be found by search engines, right? And so after a year of pilot, they finally feel comfortable enough to introduce this to the ministry itself. So actually, we have the champions, that is the uh, participation officers within each ministry to work as kind of liaison so that this kind of new design can be cleared and approved by all the ministries. How does civil society welcome um, your action? Well, initially, they think that it is, of course, an extra uh, way for people to petition, for people to have a meaningful conversation. Um, at the beginning, uh, only the ministry's issues that pertains to one single ministry get a meaningful response. And the civil society <coughs> uh, observed this and see that all the cross-ministry issues, they only get an explanation, they don't get a response. Uh, that's because no ministry would want to cross the line to uh, talk about other ministries' purview. And so any ministry who stick their necks out, so to speak, have to absorb all the risk if it's outside of their purview. So for the first two years or so of the e-petition platform, we see single ministry issue resolved pretty okay, but cross-ministry issues, they all get explanation, no solutions. 
So that is also the dual purpose of participation officer. It's not just talking to the stakeholder in the civil society, but also making it clear what is being stuck in a cross-ministry communication and to make sure, because we have a regulation, that if Ministry A think this is Ministry B's business, they're just supporting. B think it's C's business, B is just supporting. And C think it's A's business, it's just supporting. It's everybody's business. So if we uh, have a like local petition like in the south of Taiwan, the Hengchun uh, petition, they petition for a helicopter to be stationed there as ambulance because their uh, distance to a large hospital is too long. So the ambulance uh, helicopter is Ministry of Interior, but they think it's maybe Ministry of Health and Welfare's business. And the welfare people think maybe it's transportation business because all they need is a faster road. And they think maybe it's Ministry of Defense business and, and so on. But all the different ministries all travel to Hanchun, and we have succeeded in uh, having a cross-ministry team, about 30 people, to talk about this from all the different angles and with local stakeholders. And finally, we converge on setting a larger hospital there as the final solution. So basically the PO network also serves as an internal liaison with the different cross ministries. And after a few cases like that, the civil society learns that it is now possible to talk about cross ministry issues. Now I would admit that again we are not as efficient to deal with cross ministry issues as single ministries once necessarily, but we're improving on that. Mm -hmm. Um, question about democracy. Yes. The Taiwanese dem democratic model is already an example for Asia. Do you still do you, do you think it could be improved on how? Yes. So I think one of the great things about Taiwan democracy is that we're the first generation that can actually use it. <laughs> People who are older than me, uh, they still remember the martial law, where there is no democracy to speak of. There is no. Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, but now people younger than me, they don't remember the martial law anymore. So we're kind of the first generation that have access to personal computer, internet, and democracy. That also means that we don't have some legacy to respect, to honor. People can always invent new democratic ideas. So it's not like 200 years of representative democracy and 20 years of direct democracy. It's 20 years of everything. Uh, so people can experiment with participatory budgets, they can experiment with referendums, they can experiment with all those different participative ideas without having the baggage of 200 years of representative democracy. And so every year we see new democratic inventions being introduced and rapidly adopted by especially local governments and us in the central government take the part of the experiment that worked really well and amplify it to a national scale. Mm -hmm. That's a question about your background. Yes. Uh, so you left school at 12, I think? Uh, well, 14, but yes. Uh, yeah. To devote yourself to programming. Yes. Uh, it's a very uh, uh, non typical um, mm. course in a society that puts a lot of pressure on education mm. of children. Yes. So, can, can you just um, comment about that, uh, about your uh, course? Well, um, I'm, of course, an autodidact. But um, you, you said the question as if it's not uh, very typical. But in Taiwan now, up to 10% of students can be um, self-educated. Taiwan has uh, the Asia's leading law for not just homeschooling, but experimental schools of all the different kinds. So up to 10% of all the student population can enter up to college level, uh, a way that is alternative school uh, to the um, typical school system. And next year, we're rolling out a new curriculum for K-12 education that takes the best part of the experiment schools and merge it into the um, actual curriculum of all the different basic education. So things like um, curiosity or autonomous initiative and communication instead of doctrine-based uh, education, uh, achieving common good instead of for one particular skill, all these things uh, sprung out of alternative education, but now we're merging it back into the K-12 curriculum. I was part of the curriculum committee. And so I think the experiment for alternative education in Taiwan is a very inspiring example to show that not all the experiments succeed, of course, but the part that actually results in better education are being considered and merged back into the curriculum so that if in Taiwan now someone says, okay, I'm homeschooled uh, since when I was 14, it will not raise an eyebrow because it's pretty typical. I like you cats, you have had many lives. Mm -hmm. uh, just a question, can you tell us about your entrepreneurial career on your hacker background? Okay, of course. Uh, so I started a 
So I co-founded a uh, internet company uh, called the Inforian uh, Company. Um, it was a one of the highlights of Taiwan's dot-com bubble, uh, and uh, it starts as just a printing press. I was not involved back then, but when it was uh, reformed into a software company, I was entered as one of the three uh, main uh, co-founders, and we did Taiwan's first uh, e eBay-like auction website. It's called Hoobit. Uh, and we did one of Taiwan's first social media website, and I wrote one of the first meta search, that is to say search across all the search engines, but also your files on your disk and so on. And so it was pretty successful, we won some awards, uh, but then I got interested in this open source movement, so I sold my shares uh, in the company, but later on they got invested by Intel and become very high profile. And so I, I guess it is part of the dot-com um, cycle uh, that everybody put a lot of uh, help in such kind of internet e-commerce and, and things like that. Of course the dot-com also went bust and the company has folded, but I think people still remember it with some uh, fondness because it was one of the first uh, purely software companies uh, for Taiwan in the dot-com era, the other being the Yen company and so on, OpenFine and so on. Yeah. Mm, can you tell us about the go mm -hmm. the, the movement on the role it plays in the Taiwanese society? Mm -hmm. right? Yes, the GovZero movement uh, started by um, a few hackers, they call themselves the Hacker 15, uh, that was in late 2012. And they started in a hackathon because at that time there was an advertisement by the administration uh, that talks about the economic boosting plan. Uh, that is the four or eight year plan that is very complicated. And the advertisement is literally people who are actors acting as citizens look at all the budget and items and so on and feeling very confused. And their voiceover says the economic boosting plan is very complicated. It's very difficult to explain, so we're not explaining. Uh, let's just trust the government and start doing it. Um, and of course, it's taken as an insult for people's intelligence. And so it's one of the first YouTube advertisement that administration posted uh, back in 2012. And so it got flagged as spam uh, very quickly and taken out of YouTube. But instead of just protesting, I think the Hacker 15 people, the original four hackers, they thought that maybe the problem of people not understanding the budget or the plan is not the people's problem, but actually the budget not being visualized in a way that could very easily access by people. Maybe it's not inclusive enough. So they wrote the visualization platform, the budget.g0v.tw website, to visualize the national budget so people can tr uh, track individual items managed by different ministries, which, by the way, is the system we installed last month online. So the Gap Zero, one of the first projects, now become a central government uh, project. Right? But the Gov Zero idea is always like this, is what we call forking the government, taking the existing data and the plans by the government, but representing it in a way that people can understand, can relate to, and can interact with. And all the different websites in Taiwan that ends in gov.tw are government websites. So the same website that changed the O to a zero gets you into the shadow government. You don't have to search for it, it just changed one letter uh, in the URL. And so once the shadow government is proven as really working better as an alternative because we relinquish most of our copyright. So on the next procurement cycle, the government can just merge back the civil society contributions and they become official um, government websites. It's happening for the Taipei uh, participation budget and the budget visualization has been adopted by seven different cities and as well as many other uh, projects such as the environmental uh, air quality visualization or the visualization of the labor law calculator and things like that. There's many ind individual subjects that are tackled by the civil society and then merge back to the government. Mm. You still play a key role in the Gulf movement right now? In the Gulf Zero, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So every Wednesday we have a mini hackathon in one of the Gulf Zero projects called V-Taiwan and it's happening in the Social Innovation Lab and I take care of the place where it happens. Yeah. What happens in this Social Innovation Lab? I mean, you are meeting some uh, founders of startups or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I meet with anyone who has any idea about social innovation, defined as innovation that has a positive impact to the whole society, not just the founder, right? Yeah. So anyone who, who uh, have something, idea for the public good, uh, I have a uh, office hour from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. So anyone can talk to me, and there's a booking system as well. And it's not just in Taipei in the Social Innovation Lab. Every other Tuesday, I also tour around Taiwan to talk with the local social innovators, but using video conferencing to connect to 12 different ministries in the Social Innovation Lab Taipei so that people 
people can feel they're in the same room, even though they're in different corners in Taiwan. So through this way, we let the central government be mobile in the sense that they could see actually how their policy is being implemented in the rural, in the indigenous areas, and for the people there to really meet uh, the central government people as people instead of like abstract like emails and whatever, right? So in this way, we increase the empathy of people and also amplify any local idea that could work on a national or regional level. We amplify it very quickly to the central government people. Mm -hmm. There's a question about your background. Mm -hmm. During the Sunflower Movement, you plan, you have created some tools yes. uh, to promote um, the release of speech. Yes. Um, my question is, uh, has this moment played a crucial role mm -hmm. in your Sunflower Movement? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say I created it because it is just a tool that the GovZero movement has been always using for two years then, mm -hmm. right? But it's just GovZero was a relatively low profile bunch of people. Mm -hmm. But now with the Sunflower movement, everybody, uh, half a million people on the street get to have access to the same uh, collaborative tools that the GovZero movement is using. The hack folder, which is a shared bookmark, hack pad, which is the shared typing of what's uh, going on, the live streaming platform, logistics, and everything. So these were already uh, the tools that we've been using for two years by that time. It's just the Sunflower Movement amplified it so that people become generally aware of it and how these tools can make people converge on common values instead of like many other Occupy where they just diverge on whatever. Mm. Uh, question. What message did Prime Minister uh, Lin Chuan give to the society by recruiting you? Mm. Well, the Premier asked me to recruit a digital minister. They didn't uh, really recruit me. I was kind of a liaison to talk to the community. It's just people who I talk to all have other things to do, and finally I have to <laughs> try this. Uh, so um, I think one of the key messages uh, the Premier is sending out by recruiting someone from the civil society mm -hmm. is by saying um, the government is working with the people now. It's not working for the people only. Right, so the top-down uh, authoritarian government, uh, which is very popular the last century, uh, kind of poses the government as a like all-knowing uh, role, where the uh, civil society needs the government to settle disputes, to organize whatever. But now with the social media, and internet tools, everybody knows that anyone who has a hashtag can organize among people and uh, settle on common values. They don't need government anymore. So the government role, I think, uh, today is instead. Uh, providing an accountable, a transparent way for people to participate and so to let people find common values and find solutions that work for everybody without the government coming up with all those ideas. And so these values of co-creation uh, was always the core idea of the open source and the open government movement. And so the Premier, by setting one minister uh, dedicated for open government and social innovation, I think is sending a message that the cabinet is willing to work with the public service uh, to learn the art of co-creating and working with people rather than just for the people. Mm. How were you welcomed into the government? Mm -hmm. uh, how? Like how? with yeah. applause or with uh, uh, fireworks? <laughs> 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 Well, um, so um, I had a public one month of Q&A, uh, which is in September 2016, before I actually got into office, which is the 1st of October. And during this period, it's very interesting because I don't give exclusive interviews. All the media and, in fact, everybody need to ask me on this platform where I only answer publicly. And so this very interestingly uh, provides a kind of crowdsourcing of people's idea about my mandate. So I can take this uh, consensus and talk to the Premier saying, okay, so I have three conditions going in. First, I don't look at any top secret or national secret confidential information. But in exchange, all the information that I look, I say it's worthy to be publicized and to be uh, released to the public. So it's radical transparency. The second thing is that I work in an anarchistic way, or a Taoist way, which is, I guess, uh, less controversial. But in any case, it's the same thing in that I don't take command, nor will I command uh, my fellow ministers or anyone in the public service. So people don't see me as superiors. 
they see me as in a facilitative role. They come to me if they want to engage the public, mm -hmm. but if they don't come to me, I don't force them to. Mm -hmm. And so this is, I think, the voluntary basis is also very important. And the third thing is that I do get to work anywhere. I don't have to work in this office. So that means that I get to practice this mobile office and also helps digitizing the whole government apparatus so that they find it's easier to connect with me online than actually handing me a piece of paper. If I remain in this office, it's always easier to hand me a piece of paper and it would become very difficult to introduce digital workspaces. But because I say, you know, I can work anywhere uh, and also my colleagues can also work anywhere, we were able to engage with like 35 interns all over Taiwan, um, crowdsourced, um, you know, efforts uh, that works uh, to the benefit of everyone instead of just people who happen to live around Taipei. So through this innovative uh, way of working with people, I think I was welcomed not by the merit of me being a uh, issuing good commands or you know being a good superior or things like that, but in a purely facilitative role that doesn't hurt anyone's business, mm -hmm. but comes to me if they think that I can help resolve some uh, issues. So in a very Taoist way, I think I was welcoming a very calm, kind of calm and peaceful fashion. Something about Chong Chong Tu. Chong mm -hmm. uh, Chong Tu. Mm -hmm. you, you say it when there are obstacles, yes. uh, that there are opportunities, uh, yes. innovation. Can yes. you elaborate this idea? Yes, of course. So, uh, for example, last May, uh, we have a designer who, using the e-petition platform, that says our income tax filing software is explosively difficult to use. Now, that is a, a conflict, right? It's not even a actionable idea. <laughs> it is just a sentiment. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, tax filing on Mac sucks, right? And, and it's uh, full of what we call negative energy uh, in the e-petition forum. But all this changed after 48 hours when our participation officer network uh, huddled among ourselves and the Minister of Finance PO, Yang Jinghen, uh, replied publicly saying all the people who complain about the text filing software are cordially invited to attend our co-creation workshop uh, this uh, week in May, this Friday. And then anyone who has any online opinions, we promise to incorporate your online opinion in our uh, redesign of the text filing software. And just by saying that overnight uh, the sentiment changed. 80% of people become very positive and constructive and only less than 20% of people are still trolling or still venting their um, you know, negative emotions. And so by uh, basically inviting people who complain into the kitchen to cook together, we were able to flip the social expectation of the government have to know everything, but instead of bringing in the expertise from the civil society and the private sector into the co-creation process. So now this year we actually have a very good experience for Mac and Linux and tablet users to file taxes. So I think all the opportunities arise because we recognize people who uh, complain, people who raise the conflict, there is a potential that they complain because they know more than the government. And just by inviting people publicly, we can harness the energy from the civil society instead of have the government have to keep explaining but not solving problems. Mm. 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 Pakistan just passed law uh, to guarantee transgender rights. Mm -hmm. I think it was two days ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you see yourself uh, to inspire um, Taiwanese society in this uh, direction? This mm -hmm. Yeah, Taiwan, I think, is one of the places where the LGBTQ right uh, is of the highest, um, in the Asia at least. Um, and uh, it's not just the Supreme Court that recognizes marriage equality, but actually we have a very progressive uh, guideline uh, called the, um, the Gender uh, Equality Guidelines that informs all the different aspects so that when every regulation and every law, instead of uh, you know being separately uh, evaluated, all the ministries in charge of those regulation laws have to file a gender impact assessment. And so I think this is very enlightened and actually made it possible for a lot of uh, different uh, ideas about gender or transgender and so on uh, to be mainstream in a way to be just one of the factors uh, to to consider and not something that to be to make a fuss of. This is the idea of what we call intersectionality, in the sense that everybody have some part of them that are in minority, but other parts are in the majority. And we can use the part that uh, our own experience when we are in the minority to feel 
that uh, it is necessary to consider people of different predilections, and that when we're back to the places where we are in the majority, we can still consider with much more empathy and social responsibility in mind. And so this intersectional way of going forward, I think, is one of the strengths in Taiwan, because we have a plurality of ethnicities, languages, cultures, and things like that, and we have to work out a way for us to, to work uh, to get it forward. And just, I think, last week, there's also another law being passed, the National Languages Act. So now, instead of one official language, Taiwan now has 16 or uh, 20 or more than two dozen <laughs> national languages in any uh, locales, in any counties where there's more than majority speaking, say Taiwanese Hakka or one of the indigenous languages like Banza and so on, that become official language where the official documents uh, can be written in that language. Of course, we will need a lot of artificial intelligence help <laughs> to do uh, automatic translation, but it shows that we're really going where the intersectional uh, plural uh, worldview is defining the democracy values in Taiwan. You said name to me? Yeah. So just to Well, we, we can't say much about the legislation, right? There's, um, there's many uh, people who want to add on extra um, clauses uh, to the Supreme Court ruling. The Supreme Court ruling basically says that gender equality, especially around marriage, uh, need to be uh, rectified by the legislation uh, with, within two years. So it's one and one year and a few months uh, in the future. Uh, if we don't uh, ratify it in the legislation, then automatically uh, people with all the genders automatically enjoy the same right uh, as the heterogeneous uh, couples in a marriage. Right. So um, at the moment, uh, there are many people who propose many versions of that things, but because it is uh, charged by the Supreme Court to the legislation, so at the end it will be for the legislators to debate. And personally, I think um, there's a lot more in common uh, for people who are valuing marriage, uh, the sacredness of marriage, they don't want divorce and things like that, and people who are for marriage equality uh, than them to me, because I, I don't really care for marriage, I don't really want to be married. <laughs> so I, I think there's much more room for those uh, very conservative and very progressive people, because they both cherish marriage uh, to, to achieve some consensus than me achieving any consensus with them. <laughs> But I'm committed uh, to maintain, of course, this public dialogue space and the e-petition space so that people who have any parts that they want to amend or change or part of the referendum and so on, they can do it in a fair and accountable fashion. But personally, I don't have a stake in the marriage equality um, uh, law. Yeah. You said, last question, you said in interviews that you were not transgender, mm -hmm. but post-gender. Yeah. Uh, it was an interview about sex war. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, can I tell you what does it mean exactly? Right. So to be post-gender is basically said that um, I, I'm not really being defined uh, by any gender role or any performance. Um, and uh, I think I value people based on their values, right? Not monetary value, their, their core values, <laughs> the values that they live by. Um, and so I, I wrote a, a tweet about it uh, many years ago. I said that uh, I would like to know you by your values. And not, not by your types, your roles, or your classes. And, and that means basically that I uh, cherish uh, relationships built by people valuing important things and other people valuing different important things, but we find common values that can unite these things together. But I think uh, gender or, or class or type or role or race or whatever is not part of this. It may inform people's different perception about the world, and that is very important. But when we talk about the values themselves, it really shouldn't be about particular categories of people, but about how those values can be applied universally. If there is a value that cannot be applied universally and can only apply to one gender or one race, then I think it's not universal enough. Yeah, that's my basic yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Uh, I think my role is best if I am seen as being equally in distance with the public service, with the private sector, and with the civil society. Because most uh, structural problems that we see in today's world, be from climate change to all the different ecological issues and things like that, they are so-called wicked problems, meaning that they are structural and they cannot be solved by one actor acting alone. It, it must be solved by all the different stakeholders doing their commitments together and then finally doing the action together so that we can solve the coordination problem uh, with just one single actor absorbing all the risk that's never going to work. It only works if people commit just like crowdfunding. They commit to some and some amount, but only if everybody commits uh, does this project enter fruition. So if I'm seen as being biased toward one party or one sector, then I cannot be of this facilitative role to get all the whole society to commit on change. It is only if I'm equally distant to all the different sectors or on different parties and different stakeholders can I find this neutral ground for people to commit on action. And once they get a commitment publicly, they have to act. And once they act, we solve the coordination problem together. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, let's go. Yay! Yes, because uh, when we met last week, yes. you said something, I was just close to you, so I heard uh, something very interesting. You said, uh, you, okay, uh, internet web is closed in yeah. China, but you told me uh, that you are able to get to recover some data from China. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We are through the dark web. Well, there is the dark web and there's also things like GitHub and also things like the blockchain that are not currently blocked by China because if PRC blocks them, uh, it hampers their scientific progress. Okay. okay. Mm. So it, it means you have some very precise and very good information about what is going on in China about uh, uh, constraints, about uh, every, everything, but you have comments from people there. So you have very good information from... Yeah, I, I would say that uh, most of the people who work in the GovZero movement, they have basic ideas about cybersecurity and about how to use these kind of cryptographic tools. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are people who work in Hong Kong, who work in uh, the various different cities in the PRC. Uh, they are very willing to engage the GovZero network and to get their messages across. And they know they, they don't always use the, the dark net. That is kind of the last resort. Sometimes they just use the public GitHub, sometimes using the public blockchain. Okay. If I go to, to, to Hong Kong myself too, yeah. because I would like to go to the story about what is going what is happening there. Right. I think the the civil society is already uh, yeah, shrinking. Uh, yeah. shrinking yes. yes. Um, if I send you an email, maybe in uh -huh. a, a couple of weeks or months, can you help me to maybe to to, to meet some hackers or people? There? Sure, sure. If you go to the GovZero um, yeah. network, uh, there's a website called Join G Zero V that today, Join Gov Zero today. Uh, if you enter your email, you will get an invitation to the Slack channel of all the Gov Zero people. And there you s you can see plenty of Hong Kong people announcing ah. their activities. Join.gov today. Gov Zero. The O is a zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, but you're, you're free to send me emails. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Because I want to do something uh, in favor of uh, democracy and, and yeah. try, to, try to show that what is happening there is already. Mm -hmm. but, but, yeah. Yeah, because in back in the sunflower days, our technologies, they're all public. So during the umbrella uh, movement, they also use uh, many of our technologies. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, a close relationship between uh, the Hong Kong activists and the Taiwan civil, yeah, uh, civic yeah. activists. Yeah. 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 So it's very interesting. Thank you so yeah. much for, for this interview.
So I'm going to walk outside for you to take some pictures. Is that the idea? You have to talk about it. You have to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> How long do you like to talk about it? <laughs> Maybe one hour. Maybe one hour. Maybe one hour. Okay. Keep rolling. <laughs> Euh, Est-ce que pour euh, ils font des trucs genre les personnes qui regardent la caméra qui se présentent on va pas faire ça hein Je crois pas. Non on va pas faire ça genre les vidéos comme ça nous on va pas faire ça. Ah moi je trouve que j'ai non non pas trop mais non non je pense pas. Non euh, non tu vois il y a un lien ok mais caca il est dans cette bien. Il est pas content de se voir autour c'est pas. <笑>没有大部分时候都在接受采访那等一下有另外一个朋友要<笑><笑><笑><笑> Right, so, so, so I can uh, have a short walk. Yes, I have a short walk. Uh, mm. 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 Mm